There we go. Good morning. Welcome to the senior oral of Clayton Kelly. Uh, Clayton was my senior assistant, and he uh, was a great help in Great Books 4. We had a lot of fun, and I enjoyed our conversations getting to know him. My name is Johnny Custer. On the panel is uh, Mr. A.J. Priya and Mr. Steve Westfall. Uh, we'll have, uh, we'll let um, Clayton give a, about a 15 minute um, presentation and then we'll have some discussion uh, and I'm excited uh, for you guys to hear what he has to say. Uh, let me open us in prayer and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, uh, you are good and um, we acknowledge that in all you do, um, you have made things wonderful and according to what is really true and noble and good. And so um, we praise you and we ask that you would um, uh, be glorified here as we uh, reflect on your world um, and who you've made us to be. And so um, go before Clayton and uh, the words that he says, and I pray that you will give him uh, boldness and strength um, to declare your truth. And so uh, we pray these things in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever experienced a part of life that brought about doubt, sadness, or anxiety? If you are a human, these situations are inevitable. It could be something as minor as failing a test or a bad day at work, or something as serious as a terminal illness causing you doubt and fear. On the contrary, have you ever experienced a part of life that brought about happiness, security, or confidence? These are the situations that we love and will always seek. It could be something as minor as having a good day at work or school or passing pre-cal and physics in the same year. As humans, we will always prefer these high mountaintops of life, and when we're there, it's very easy to give thanks and praise. But what about the times when you're faced with a valley? A valley is when you are faced with situations that are difficult, uncomfortable, irritable, and interrupt your life's flow entirely. <clears throat> I'm sure everyone here can think of one time where life just didn't go the way they wanted it to go. Whether that be involved with failure, sickness, change, loss, mistakes, and many other reasons. Instead of running from these valleys, prepare to face them head on by living faithfully for the Lord, giving praise with a thankful heart and anticipation of how God wants to strengthen you within this time. However, not everybody will experience valleys of the same severity. In fact, some people may never go through a severe valley at all in their life. For example, I'm a 19-year-old kid who enjoys the power lift, but with that comes injuries and lots of plethoras of uh, aches and pains to keep me from doing what I love. That's a valley that's rather minor. Now take Job from the Bible, a man who lived according to God's will entirely with immense faith. He was struck with a deadly illness as well as having his family and wealth taken from him. He had nothing left except for his faith in the Lord. Now if you know the story of Job, you know that that faith is what got him through his valley. That is a very severe valley. So, when studying this topic, two questions came to my mind. First, are the severe valleys more beneficial or important overall for you to learn and mature from? And second, does God use those who go through severe valleys like Job more than he uses those who go through minor valleys like myself? To help answer these questions, I interviewed Dr. Ernest Easley, who was the senior pastor of First Baptist both in Odessa and in Roswell, Georgia, and is currently the teaching pastor and head of evangelism of First Baptist in Cleveland, Tennessee. To begin, I asked him my first question, and he replied with, There are things to be learned in the severe valleys that cannot be learned in the minor valleys, and there are things to be learned in the minor valleys that cannot be learned in the severe valleys. Regardless of the severity of it, God is trying to teach you something that will bring you closer to Him. When asking him my second question, he replied with, God uses all of His people for different purposes, severe valleys or not. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31, Paul shows us when talking to the people in Corinth that God uses the weak to shame the strong, and uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Thank God for the teens working at some restaurant to service food who probably haven't gone through a severe valley yet. And thank God for the doctors who treat terminally ill patients who have probably faced one or two severe valleys. In the end, no matter the severity of it or what stage of life you're in, God uses all of them to sculpt and strengthen His people so that they may be closer to Him. However, not everybody wants to live faithfully for God, not even some Christians in some cases. For example, I interviewed a person very close to me who was once a Christian of strong faith, sculpting his life to line up with God, with the Bible, as in his guide on how to achieve strong moral Christian values. At one stage of his life, he denounced his faith and began living according to his own will and of the wave of this world. 
When I asked him about living faithfully now, he said, trying to live faithfully when I felt that God had turned his back on me was frustrating. I couldn't understand why God allowed for such horrible things to happen to me and to those around me who were of the faith. It seemed like he didn't hear me when I called for help and guidance when life went bad, and it seemed to have never ended. It lasted for years. Plus, if Christianity is real, I will still go to heaven. From a worldly view, this makes sense. Why would you willingly take orders from someone who you can't see, who doesn't seem to aid you in your time of need? Plus, if you are a Christian who has been saved, a worldly view asks us, why not commit all the sins that you want, considering they're all ransomed for? My friend could not understand this, as well as why God allowed for terrible things to happen to Christians. And sometimes it's difficult to bear this fact because it seems to be true a lot of the time. Bad things just happen to good people. If you live faithfully, you negate yourself to fulfill your own desires, and you put yet another authority above your head that works according to his own time, as my friend would say. It seems the stronger faith you have, like Job, the more severe valleys you will face, like Job. So why would you willingly work to strengthen your faith if in the end you can be a Christian who is saved and still commit all the worldly sins you want to? Either way, you're destined to fail and experience substantial amounts of loss and pain. Why not get the best of both worlds like my friend did? In our apologetics class, in which we defend our faith and learn about others, we often talk about this topic. Your small amount of time spent on earth determines how your eternity will be spent. Not everybody will have the same gifts in heaven, even though everybody is ultimately satisfied. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 it states, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether evil or good. You get judged exactly for what you did, and so does the person next to you, who may or may not be granted more or less, depending on their faithfulness. This is why you should live as faithfully as you can right now, and not settle as a lukewarm Christian like my friend did. To get some further wisdom on this contrary belief, I also read Dr. Easley's book, Through the Valleys, that takes us through his own personal valley with squamous cell carcinoma, which is throat cancer. In his book, when he received the news that he had a fast-growing malignant cancer, he states, I wish I would have raised my hands to the air, praising God for the cancer that he has allowed me to have. However, I didn't. I immediately became extremely doubtful, fearful, and thought, why? I didn't know why God was allowing me to suffer like this. A couple days after his diagnosis, easily realized that his fear had overtaken his faith. Within his book, he states, Fear and faith are extremes. They are totally opposite. You cannot have faith when fear moves in, and vice versa. Versa. He realized that he should have been asking God, what do you have in store for me within this time, instead of asking God, why the heck are you allowing me to suffer like this? God allowed him to suffer a severe valley to show him that his own faith can always be strengthened, even as a pastor. However, it's not as easy as it sounded to get to this conclusion. At the beginning of his treatment, Dr. Easley was so stunned by his diagnosis that he wouldn't let the nurses help him. He didn't allow a feeding tube to get put in. He said he saw the feeding tube as giving up or giving in to this illness. Easily entered a fight-or-flight mode and acted immediately upon his fear and not his faith. He thought, how do I fix this? He immediately forgot about God's sovereignty over all situations, even as horrible as this one. I'm sure all of us in here at the News of Cancer would think the exact same way. How do I fix this? Where do I go from here? And leave God in the rear view. Then when he came within an inch of his life due to lack of nutrition, he thought, God has already been where I'm going. And he promises his children that his plans are for their good. And this suffering is so temporary compared to God's ultimate prevailing goodness. When Dr. Easley realized that God had a purpose of good behind all things, and that God even allows and orchestrates valleys, Dr. Easley gave his fear and worries to God and let the nurses help him. But how do we combat fear in our own personal valleys, which may or may not be as severe as this? In our Book of Revelations class, we talked often about how life on earth in the end times, and in some cases the present, will be brutal, painful, and unpleasant. We studied timelines of the chronologically correct Book of Revelation, and with every chart we drew, it always ended with God's goodness prevailing with us, no matter how bad it was before. Mr. Westfall said we learn to die or give ourselves up daily for the Lord, knowing that His goodness prevails every time in the end. And that should make us fearless in the midst of the valley considering God is still in control and is never not in control. We should remain encouraged to be faithful within a valley because every valley that comes to you went through God first. God knows exactly what you can handle better than you even know and knows exactly how much of something you need for correction or redirection. 
this is an area where God can really use valleys and tough times to show him to show you what he wants you to do or to get you to lay down a sinful tendency. Either way, goodness prevails. That should continue to keep us motivated, encouraged, confident, and fearless within the valley. Even if we have a tough time being strong in that fact, in the end, God delivers his children and uses those valleys of pain and suffering for good. The truth of it is, valleys will be thrown in your face until the day God calls you home. We are promised this in John 16, 33. But no matter how severe it is or how bad it gets, God is using it equally for your good and his kingdom. God uses all of his people in diverse ways, regardless of your age or what size of valleys you face. So be a light in this dark world by living faithfully within it, having no fear in this world, because every valley that comes to you went through God first. So I invite everyone in here, no matter what they're going through, to give it to God by living faithfully with a thankful heart in anticipation of how God wants to strengthen you. Thank you. Well done, Clayton. Well, does... Uh, oops. Yikes. I almost tipped over the table here. Um, does uh, this seem like a... Um, you've gotten out of the valley now into a... Yes. I, th- I think Ryan Sturdivant said it great uh, yesterday in his oral. He said, I feel like I've been climbing a thousand foot ladder for six years and I just went down a two foot slide. <laughs> nice. So. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad this seems like this will be um, a lot lighter and uh, uh, more enjoyable. Tell us about your plans next year. Uh, I plan on going to Texas A&M to do business and uh, with a bunch of fellow Aggies in here, so it should be fun. Nice. Anticipating any valleys there? Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Y- yeah? I'm sure. In, any in the, the schoolwork or the homework? Sorry, what? In the homework load or the, yes. the workload? Yes. 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 How, come, how come that seems to be like a valley to most people when it seems like learning should be a good thing, right? Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely think learning should be seen as a positive thing. I think you should look forward to it. And I definitely think the older that I've gotten, I've learned to enjoy it more and see it more as my friend than like, oh, I have to do this and I can't go to the practice gym. So I definitely will still have that mindset going into college, but we'll see how it goes the first day and see how heavy it is. So Yeah. Well, what do you think presents it as being, uh, I don't know, uh, not pleasant or um, difficult or hard um, to do the homework when you know it's good or helpful for you? I think it's just because uh, kids our age and younger, um, they just want to do stuff that kids want to do. And they even as seniors, there's stuff that we don't want to do with homework. And so because we don't want to do it, we see it as a thing that we don't enjoy, even though we know we have to do it and that it will in turn pay us back somehow, but we got to get through that barrier of doing it even though we don't really want to do it. But once you start seeing it as fun and you start seeing it as like a positive, I think it doesn't look like a valley anymore. So so you, uh, it seems like you're, you know, there's some experiences as you learn, as you see those things, you begin to have that foresight of, oh yeah, actually I went through this and it really wasn't that bad. But going through it, um, you might not be able to see why it's bad. Um, so is part of the difficulty in valleys not being able to see what you're going through? I definitely think so. Um, my thing that I struggle with is I like to be like planned and calculated for when the time comes. I like to know what's coming. I like to like anticipate and like know 100% like, okay, this is what's going to happen. But we don't, we hardly ever know 100% what's actually going to happen. And so I think that's just a place where you need to give it to God and in the end he'll work it out for you somehow because you need to worry about what's happening right now in the present because God's got so much to tell you right now. Mm-hmm. So if you just keep worrying about the future, you're going to miss everything in the present. Mm-hmm. That's good. Uh, so you uh, you are a uh, weightlifter, right? Yes, sir. How long have you been weightlifting? Uh, competitively, uh, like a year or two years, and then just like normal. I think my dad taught me when I was like 11. So yeah. Okay. Well, have you had any really difficult times weightlifting? Uh, luckily, I haven't like broken or torn anything, but like currently I haven't been able to squat for like three weeks because I think there's something wrong with my hip. But I like I said, that's something rather minor. You could work around that. There's much worse things that could happen. So, What, what are some of the worst things for weightlifters? <sighs> torn muscles or dislocations. So have like nice purple bruise all the way down your leg. So yeah. I've seen that happen before. Was there ever a time that you knew something was going to be difficult? 
um, and weightlifting are, I guess, in another area, and you um, did it anyways. Yeah, um, I've, I don't know, I guess I'm just fragile, but I always would go into competitions, like, just hurting everywhere, and just, like, hips were bad, back was bad, I was like, I still gotta do this anyway, so, it's not, me worrying about it, it's not gonna fix this pain, so, might as well go into it with a joyful heart, and so, still did it, and it went well. Hmm. Um, that kind of uh, tells me a little bit, um, you know, I was thinking about, well, how do you prepare, what do you do, um, about that, and, uh, for you, you acknowledge it's going to be painful um, and that there's something on the other side to go through. Um, so in your paper, one of the things you um, say about in defining a valley, I think it's at the very, near the very beginning, um, is that a valley is when you are faced with situations that are difficult, uncomfortable, and interrupt life's flow. What, can you elaborate on what is life's flow? Uh, I think life slows the way you want it to go. I think it's how you planned it to be, how you plan it in your head to go. And then when it doesn't go according to your plan, like 99% of the time, it's probably not going to go according to your plan. You get frustrated. And uh, whether that be like a failed test, even though you knew you were going to fail it because you didn't study, or, or injuries or whatnot, and sicknesses. I feel like sicknesses is definitely one of the most common ones, especially for those who play sports. You get, I feel like you always get sick before like a big game, or you get hurt before a big game. And so... Instead of like, I guess complaining and worrying about those, those are the things that interrupt your, I guess what you wanted your life slow to be. Everybody's flow is different. So, hmm. do you think God has a a, a way that um, He wants life to go? Uh, I think the only thing He really wants from you is for you to acknowledge Him and to be noticeable of Him and to actually have a relationship with Him and love Him and uh, call upon Him, even in the good and the bad. Be thank, give Him thanks for good things and. If you're going through a valley, I still give it to him and say, I acknowledge you. Um, I know you're working through this still. And you're still sovereign, so I give it to you. So I think he just wants your recognition in the midst of the valley, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, as being a father, that does seem to be um, the heart of it. Um, uh, all the other things are great and nice and, and gravy, but having, you know, my sons, you know, come to me as young as they are, um, really does seem to be um, the, the good, the value. Um, so, uh, in thinking about your um, your oral, and uh, I did a lot of uh, reading and thinking about different things. One, uh, I went back to since it's uh, the title is "Living Faithfully Through the Valleys." I went back to Psalm 23. Um, you know, the the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul, and he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, it's odd. The first, um, the first three things, you know, he says here um, is he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Those are all great things for us, right? Pleasant mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, who wouldn't want to, um, you know, have good quiet waters and green pastures and have their their soul restored? The the fourth thing is kind of seems to be a little out of place. Um, the first three we want, right? Yeah. Um, why do you think he has the last one in there? He guides me be, um, in paths of righteousness. Um, I think the righteousness part is something that you have to be willing to do. Um, he's going to always present you with a path that's righteous, but with that comes times that are not necessarily what you'd want. I feel like God can really work through valleys more than... I mean, there's like... I don't want to say it, but there's a golden mean. <laughs> there's, there's... Like I mentioned in my paper, there's a good amount of good times that God can really use, and you need those. And there's also a golden mean of bad times that you need as well. There's a balance. And... Um, Everybody can think of like there's a time where they did something like, oh, that was so stupid. I'm never doing that again. And you learn from it. Or like a little kid touching a stove, like that was hot. I'm not ever going to do that again. And so God presents you with this righteous path in which you'll be hit with things. But God is still going to be there with you on this righteous path. You have to choose to stay on it. Because he'll always be there. But you have to choose to stay on it, even as life gets bad. Hmm. What, um, what do you think makes us begin to shift in our perspective and value righteousness instead of just wanting to to have pleasures or 
want to enjoy life or you know not to have you know our soul unstable or um, some of those things what do you think makes um, begins to shift that perspective where we go uh, righteousness really is a good thing I want it I think it's really when you start thirsting for what's beyond um, I think once you really start thinking with the Christ-like mind you really start trying to live it out some of these worldly pleasures start to just fade in the background. They don't seem interesting anymore because you're investing in heaven now. You're investing in eternity, which is way more awesome than investing in like earthly things. So um, I think with that, you start to... Um, we talked about this uh, when Mr. Westall subbed for one of our apologetics class. You increase in personhood, so you're becoming more open, to whereas going to hell would be decreasing in personhood, coming more inward like... Uh, uh, selfish, and so I think when you stay on that righteous path, and you become more uh, increasing in person, or yeah, you become more open. You begin to start to whittle out the things that don't matter, and you start to open up the opportunity for more heavenly things to come in, and you get more of a eternal mindset. I'd say. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, picture from the Great Divorce is very apt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, one more uh, line of questioning, and then I'll pass the mic here. Um, so, in your paper, you talk about that you can learn from uh, learn things in severe valleys um, that can't be learned in minor valleys, and you can learn things in minor valleys that can't be learned in severe ones. W what are some of those things that you can learn in minor valleys that can't be learned in severe valleys? Um. Well, we'll take Dr. Easley for instance. Uh, he's a pastor, and he got throat cancer. It's like the worst kind of cancer you get for a pastor um and so that's extremely severe and that's really bad and almost killed him and so as a pastor he already has like an understood really good amount of faith i'd say and um through this he told me the thing he realizes that he wasn't as strong in his faith as he thought he was and he said stubbing his toe on a door is not going to teach him oh i need to strengthen my faith he had to go through something really bad to like tell him that his faith could still be strengthened and um, I guess from a minor valley standpoint, you could be, I guess, say like an irresponsible seventh, eighth, ninth grader and not do your homework and go to the gym and you read bad grades and thus you learn from your failure that uh, you need to like pay attention to grades and you need to get on top of things. And so I think that is a valley that's rather minor because nothing really bad is happening. You're just learning to like time management well, uh, to whereas a pastor that already has good faith needs to go through something really severe to learn that his faith wasn't as good as he thought it was before. So, hmm. Thanks. Um, so in that contrast of those two, the minor and the, the severe valleys, do you think you ever, I don't know, compared your pain or suffering or the hardships you went through to someone else's that wasn't that bad? Uh, yeah. Um, personally, I haven't gone through much yet, which I'm very thankful for. Um, I'm glad I get to talk with people that I have so I can learn in case something does and I can kind of prepare in case it does. Um, I definitely think it helps to find somebody that has suffered the same values as you before, I guess like a spiritual mentor. Um, find someone that's gone through before if you're really struggling with it and see what things worked out for them and talk about it. And definitely don't be like a lone gun and be like, I can do this by myself. I don't need anybody's help, like Garrett. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, Garrett has no emotion. Um, but definitely, I'd say seek out, be open about it uh, to the people that you trust. And um, I think comparing really helps. Because like, comparing really helps me. Like I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling good today. I'm sad. I'm mad, this, that, and the other. And then I look at like your, your condition or Dr. Easley's condition. I'm like, things could be so much worse. I need to be thankful for why I don't have any of that right now. And I don't have to worry about that. And so I think that's another, like, perspective opener. Like, you present yourself, your life, compared to someone who's gone through much, you see that you really haven't gone through that much, and you should be thankful for what God has allowed you to go through healthily. So, hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, you know, we can get into this comparing game. And so I, I was going to ask, you know, about that mentally, and, and, but you shared, you know, well, um, what it should drive you to do is not compare but be grateful for where you're at. I was actually sitting um, in uh, an office um, yesterday, and I was, a person was telling me about 
someone they knew that had their they were born with their esophagus detached from their stomach and uh, through 25 different surgeries went on to lose their stomach and has had to have a feeding tube for most of their life. So um, there's always someone who has a worse pain and suffering and uh, what it does, I think you're right, gratitude um, mm -hmm. teaches you to value and, and be grateful for the things you have. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm, I'm going to pass it for now. Thanks. Did you say thanks when he said he was going to pass the mic? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Gosh, so glad that's over. Oh, man, I'm glad that's yes. over. So. <laughs> yeah. All oh, right. Gosh. I'm glad I'm wearing my cross yeah, that necklace. Was just the, that was just the primer. Here we go. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, gosh, Clayton, um, you know, your paper uh, was five pages long and which isn't very long speech speech um but you oh your paper is different than this it was a little bit longer gotcha yeah. me and mr custer uh, we were at like three thousand words okay and he was like oh, yeah i think you should cut i'm glad you trimmed it down and i guess i didn't see the paper but you packed a lot of really difficult questions into five pages of text yeah and um I, you know as i kept reading it was like man I got I got into a lot of rabbit holes and I got into some dark places as I was, as, as yeah. I was reading your paper. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? Like, I guess there's not many 19 year olds. I would imagine that there aren't many who th um, who who think about deep dark valleys. Like, what prompted that for you? Was it interacting with this friend that you've that you've mentioned a few times, or was it something else? Um, as like a younger kid, and even a little bit now. I was always super anxious, creating things in my head that didn't even happen, never happened, still haven't happened, um, and I just like spaz myself out basically. And so I was always played like the victim, like oh I'm the victim. This is someone did this to me, or uh, I'm not the one at fault here. I haven't done anything wrong. This, that, and the other. And then I heard about like people that have gone through like way more than me, and I was like. I'm being really selfish considering like what I'm thinking about myself. Like this is ridiculous. I could be in a hospital bed right now, but instead I'm here complaining about my own little problem. And I always like deep thought, as you know. I like space, I like philosophy, I like things that are mind boggling. And so I really thought deep on this, like, okay, what's God's nature and how would he take this? And when I realized that even with something like this, like anxiety, when I started seeing it more as like a something I can grow from, like we learned in Jared's world, um, I, uh, it really was an eye-opener, and that anxiety started to teach me things, and um, instead of like hindering me, and uh, it's gotten so much lesser, and uh, it's like almost not even there anymore, and so it's just really a prayer answered, and uh, I'd say that's really how I came across this topic, and then I read like, I talked with Custer about his condition, talked with Dr. Easley about his condition, and I've just seen like some really crazy things happen to people, and I'm just like, I have no place to complain about my area. So, so one of the phrases that comes to mind, thank you for sharing that, is uh, survivor's guilt. Do you know what that is? I don't. So it's basically like when you see other people endure significant tragedy, and you're on the other side not having oh, yeah. uh, endured that or have uh, maybe endured it and survived it. You know, it's like people uh, who have gone through war. Yeah. Talk about survivor, survivor's guilt. Um, do you think that kind of this comparison mindset that you're talking about as you look at Mr. Custer's condition or Easley, mm -hmm. Mr. Easley's condition, that survivor's guilt can become dangerous to you, that the comparison uh, it, can be unhealthy? Um, I think it can become unhealthy... I think it can become more unhealthy when you're selfish and you're not willing to, I guess, give it to God and not you. I guess some people, uh, when they go through hard things, they really value, I guess, attention, and uh, they become more self-centered around that. And while it is very good to have people help you with your struggles, it shouldn't be for the sole reason of like, I don't know, oh, feel bad for me because this happened to me, um, or people. I guess you become less respectful of what happened to other people, because like you mentioned, like people from war, they've gone through a lot, and when you become more self-centered, you forget about that, and your perspective shrinks, and you forget about things could be a lot worse, things could be really bad right now, but they're not, 
and you need to be thankful for that. So I think, I think it can be, especially with uh, smaller valleys. I definitely think the smaller the valley, you become more, I guess, inward upon it. Like Mr. Custer, he doesn't have an option. Like he has this, and it's very severe, and um, he realizes it, and he's given it to God, and so. It's like he has nowhere else to go but to God. But with smaller value, you can go anywhere. You don't have to go to God. And you should, but you don't have to if you're not focused on it. So so I want to hear more about some of your interactions with your friend. Um, I, I have friends like that, too. And, and um, I'm curious to know if, as you've interacted with that friend, uh, if you found yourself persuaded by any of his ideas um, that you go, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The um, one that announces faith? Yeah. Um, well, when we were, let's see, how old were we? We were pre-teenagers. I don't know what year, but uh, he was like 18 at the time, and he was just on fire for the Lord, and he was really going all in, and he got married really young, like really, really young, and uh, she was a strong Christian, and they were crazy for each other, and they got married and then left and went to California to actually pursue ministry. And um, so I always saw him growing up as like this on-fire-for-God type person, and uh, uh, I definitely used him. I guess I kind of say he was a mentor. I was really too young to consider what a mentor was, but I always saw him as somebody who exemplified like good Christian morals for what I knew at my age. And then on his uh, social medias, I noticed that he was, like, getting a bunch of tattoos, shaved his head. He was doing things he shouldn't have been doing, and his wife was no longer with him. And I didn't know what was going on. I was really confused. And then I figured out a year later that he totally, like, dropped his face, dropped the ministry, did this, that, and the other. And I had no idea why. And so um, when I figured out, like he got with the wrong group of people and they persuaded he's he's a people pleaser and so when he heard like some i don't know if there's like a scientific term for this but like uh christian i guess anti-christians so they're just like atheists that just hate christianity not like the atheists we talk to like atheists that are like trying to burn down christianity he got in with that crowd and he figured and they told him a bunch of things like oh, christianity is racist christianity is sexist christianity is um all kind of the things that end with ist and <laughs> and uh, as a people pleaser he was like this is horrible this is I can't believe I did this for 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 years um, I'm on the wrong side of the road and uh, he told me some of the things like about how like it's derogatory and uh, it's fake and this that and the other and at a young age I was like open to it so I was like sure and then uh, I didn't really think much of it because I was like, I think I just turned 13 maybe. And I was still the kid at the practice gym. And uh, I didn't really face much. And so when he said that, yeah, it really did open up like a door. And I started considering. And uh, he just told me, I think the thing that hit me the hardest when I was that age and I was young and I didn't know anything about this uh, was all the things that happened to him. Uh, while he was a Christian were pretty bad. He really struggled with spiritual warfare and like a bunch of sickness and uh, lots of death. And uh, even when he got to ministry in California, that just multiplied. Like he saw like how like, I guess how hard it is to like minister, especially in that uh, is California. And then he was going off in over states and, or national. And um, he saw like the death and the, sickness and the pain and he was like can't believe a loving god would do this mm -hmm. and that's really the big thing that he said to me and i really started questioning that and uh I'm glad i came to a conclusion where i'm still a christian so <laughs> do you think it's dangerous for somebody in your position at 13 then or 19 now to grapple with those things yeah definitely um Anything that could persuade you, I, I think there's a healthy amount. I think you need to think about these things, and I think you need to grow, because that's how you're really spiritually going to grow, is going through hardship and having these hard questions be asked and talked about. And um, 
I think at a younger age, like I was, it's definitely dangerous because as like a little kid, you're open to everything, and you see your cool cousin do something, and you want to do what your cool cousin does, and um, so yeah, I definitely think it'd be dangerous. That's what happened to him. As you can see, it's very dangerous. He he's gone off the deep end, and so uh, that's good. Yeah. I I just want to say one quick comment, and then I'll pass the mic. But actually, I think it's good that you've encountered that now. Um, I'm glad I have. Uh, it's, you know, I've just, as you, as I read what you wrote, there's, there's, there's books that you've read that ask those same kinds of questions. You know, I, I brought a couple of them up here, but Brothers K, you know, Ivan, basically, that's his Grand Inquisitor speech that he delivers is like, wait, God, God why do you allow all this stuff to happen? You know, mm. where are you in the midst of suffering? And uh, I think all of us face that at some point. And if all you get when you're young is just easy answers, then um, when you start to have those questions, then um, as an adult, you don't necessarily know where to turn. And so I'm glad that you got to face some of those while you're still at home or still around mentors. And uh, so I wouldn't really wish that on somebody, but it's just part of living in a fallen world. So thank Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. All right, Clayton. Man, what a topic. I, I'm ready for uh, Cademan's three-hour oral. You know, we could have three hours talking about this. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be kind of be all over the place because there's a lot of ideas. Um, so you've brought up Aristotle, right? I know you mm-hmm. didn't want to do it with the golden yeah. mean, but yes. you did it, right? We're contractually obligated uh, yeah. this year Gosh. to mention uh, the golden mean. <sighs> so I want to bring up some other Aristotle. Okay. okay, and so one of the things Aristotle, I'm probably butchering the exact quote, but he says, all men seek that which they view as good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what do you think men view as good? Um, at a, it depends, I guess, on what point in life you're in and like how strong your faith is. Uh, for example, my friend once saw seeking the kingdom of God is the best thing ever, and he really went hard to go find it. And now he sees anything worldly as good. And he sees the kingdom of God as the complete opposite. And so I think it's really how your perspective is changed amongst the people you're with and the people you surround yourself with and the experiences and the places you've been. Um, And I would like to think that he can change his perspective and come back to the faith. Um, He's been saved. Um, I'd like to think he could come back and live for God once again and change his perspective once again and see seek what is good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just don't know. He, Like I said, he's one of those, like I don't want to say radical atheists, but kind of is. Kind of sounds like it. It's, yeah. it's intense. And so uh, I just, yeah, there's that. Okay. So I, I thought I heard you say he married an unbeliever. Was that right? No, he married a believer. She was a believer. Yeah. Okay. But you don't have any idea what kind of happened in their marriage? Or? Nope. Like I said, I was 13. I was young. And uh, I figured out a year later that they were separated and crap was going down. Okay. So. W- what do you think is the role of obedience in all of this? Because it sounds like at some point your friend began to be disobedient to the Lord. Right? So how does obedience play into this the whole valley issue? I think obedience is the choice you make to give it to God. I think obedience is the choice that God gives you to make in free will. Because if you didn't, if He didn't give you a choice, if He just made us say the Garden of Eden just didn't happen, just say He just put us all in heaven and just let us be. That's not real love. That's kind of like brainwashing, okay. you could say. And so He loves us so much that He withheld His power to do that, and He gave us a real choice. And with that choice comes the choice to be obedient to him. And we get to choose that. And he chose it at one stage of his life, but he got influenced by the wrong crowd, and now he's disobedient, I'd say. Okay. So I think obedient plays a very strong role in this, because you have the choice, like, okay, this is happening, here's the cards I've been dealt, am I going to give it to God, or am, going, or am I going to feel bad for myself? Okay. Okay, good. Um, so kind of circling back to this, all men you know, seek what they view as good, do you, it sounds like your friend has kind of has a different view of what's good now. Yes, very. Um, so, would you say there's an objective good, and then if there is, what is that? Talking to Mr. Custer's uh, friend, uh, the atheist, uh, we I think Grayson asked him this question, or um, and he was kind of stumped. He didn't really know where to go, and he kind of just concluded with, uh, I guess, for atheists in my friend's case, um, it's. 
whatever you want it to be, I guess. Us Christians kind of have the same wavelength of what we think is good, and um, or I guess what we know is good, um, which is the kingdom of God. But for an atheist, it gets very much more complicated. Which, for my cousin's case, it's like drugs and drinking and bad things like that and just a dark path. And for your atheist friend who was very open, uh, it seemed to me like his good was family and friends and um, happiness. So, like I said, two very different sides of the table. So, Okay. So it's more like existentialism, Mm -hmm. right? Like you choose whatever you view as good. Mm -hmm. Um, So do you think that that's a, a biblical perspective? I think our biblical perspective is the one true God is good. I think that's the good that we should all have as our end goal. Mm-hmm. And um, he kind of makes it pretty simple for us, like, love God, love others. Okay. And uh, I think that should be our our goal. I think that should be our good. And um, with atheists, it goes many different ways. So. Okay. All right. So I've got to switch gears. We're running low on time. Um, so I, w- I want to kind of push back a little bit on this idea of comparing because, um, you know, we've kind of talked about let's compare ourselves to others. There could always be worse off. And I think that's one side of it, but we could always compare ourselves to those who are better off mm-hmm. and say, well, how am I in this position? Right? So I, I don't know that that's the, the best way to go about things. So I want to ask you about Job. What about Job? You know, because we say things could always get worse. How could it have gotten worse for Job? <laughs> I don't think it could have. Gosh, he, <laughs> he had a really rough time. Gosh, it was, and it's pretty pretty detailed in the Bible of what exactly happened. And kind of, you can relate this to Dr. Easley's situation with throat cancer. It could get worse than that, as we can see in Job. But um, Job was already somebody who was very close to the Lord. He was very strong in his faith. And I guess it took something like that severe to really... And God didn't break Job. He remained faithful the entire time. Dr. Easley broke faith at one point. He was so scared, and I think that's how, in a way, our sin nature can come out, and we fear, and we go to worldly fixes, and um, I think it's really tough, because Job didn't break. We break all the time, Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I think Job's a really good example of how we should see things. I doubt any of us in here will have anywhere near that happen to us. I hope Job. not. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. Um, but I definitely think he's a great example of how we should go about things. Okay, and so, you know, are you familiar with Job's story, the whole thing? Mm, yeah. Ish? Yeah. yeah, I know you're on the spot. Yeah. Um, do you remember what changed for Job? Like, what was what was the big change at the end? Um, sorry about that. That was a little loud. No, that's fine. Just keep, uh, him, keep him awake. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what's I, a culmination of the story? Do you remember what happens? It's very vague. Could you okay. help me out? Yeah. So at the end, you know, he's kind of complaining. He wants his he wants his day in court, right? He wants yeah. to see the Lord. He wants to, and then the Lord shows up. And does the Lord give him an answer? Do you remember? I don't remember. He, yeah, he doesn't give him an answer. Yeah. And so it's not till he gets his eyes on the Lord that then that's, that's the change, mm-hmm. right? He sees the Lord for who he is. And so I kind of want to bring that uh, one other passage. Um, end of John's gospel, remember uh, Jesus restores Peter. And then he says this to Peter. He says, most assuredly I say to you, so it's Jesus talking to Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. So he's telling Peter he's going to die a violent death. Mm-hmm. Okay? And so then Jesus gives him that instruction, follow me. And so then Peter does what I argue we all do. Right? We compare. Peter, turning around, saw John, whom Jesus loved following, who would lean on his breast and said, Lord, is this the one who betrays you? And then this is what Peter said to Jesus about John. Lord, but what about this man? Mm-hmm. Kind of what his thing. Do you remember what happened next? No? Okay. He's, this is what Jesus said to Peter. If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Mm-hmm. So when we look at Job and we look at what Jesus says here in the Gospel of John, what do you think is the instruction for us in the valley? I think God telling him that he's going to die a severe death is 
uh, clearly it's a bad thing. Like you don't look forward to that. Right. But God told him he knows what's coming. Right. I wish I knew what was coming. <laughs> I'm sure all of us in here wish we knew what was coming. Right. That'd be great, but we don't. And um, the same rule applies. Follow me. And um, even though we don't know, and he did know, and um, that's something that I envy because I wish I knew what was coming tomorrow and the next day and the next day. But I think that's a really powerful statement, just follow me. I think that's really just the thing we need to have in our head at all times is God's sovereignty over it, even even if he does tell you you're going to have a bad death. but. Right. And, and so then that, that frees us from comparison to those who are worse off and to those who are better off. Definitely. Because then our eyes are only focused on the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, one last thing, and I'll turn it back, is one more Aristotle. I've got to shoehorn this in. Uh, <laughs> do you remember Aristotle's three types of friendship? Uh, you, uh, yeah. Virtuous, utilitarian, and um, the one that, that young people seek all the time. Called the what? Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, right? And so what, a pleasure relationship, what's that? Uh, I think you're just in it to get some kind of emotion out of it. Yeah. You're not in it for, like, truth. It's fun, yeah. right? What about utility? Utility is you're using somebody. Yeah, for using somebody. Means to an end. Yeah, and then what's virtuous? Virtuous is, like, you truly care about somebody and you are, like, both of like the same wavelength and it's more than just using somebody and trying to get something out of it you care for the person all right so which type of f- friendship or relationship do you think we should have with the lord virtuous yeah and so how will that help us in the valleys i think seeing god as like i said someone that's always there and sovereign of the situation as a virtuous friendship and not using god as a means to an end opens up a lot of doors and we don't have to I think it really eliminates fear. Like, if you really believe that, I think fear is really eliminated when you see God as virtuous and you see Him as sovereign over it. So, all right, thank you, Lane. Mm-hmm. All right, I want to um, pick up on one or two threads that uh, Mr. Westfall uh, went in, and I'm glad he brought them up because it's at the, the crux. What's that? One thread. All right, one thread. One. Matt, there's, there's like five here. Um, I narrowed it down to five. Down to one. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. This is Johnny's family. Yeah. <laughs> only, only, only Mine. one question to ask. Oh. Um, okay. One thread. Um, we'll do this one because I, I, I think it's at the um, at the core of um, of your oral, and you and you bring it up, you know, with your friend who came to this place, um, and he, you know, like Job, he goes to these valleys, these hard things, and like Job, um, God doesn't give him an answer. He cries out, he wants it, um, and God's silent. Um, why do you think God is silent And some of these times when we, we need to hear from him most? I think it's just a way that he really shows you how far your faith actually stretches. Like, if he were to answer you all the time, immediately our faith would be very minimal. It'd be very weak. Um, we go one second with pain and God doesn't answer when in the reality he always answers, then we can't stand it. Um, so I think him not answering at certain times or answering in the way that you want him to answer is a way to strengthen you. I think it's a way that, um, in a way, we can become more reliant on him and know that even he's not answering now, God's timing is perfect. It's it's awesome. If we had our own way and we had like the knowledge of God, I'm sure it'd be hellfire and rain if we just got to pick whatever we wanted and stuff like that. But he's got perfect timing. Even if and we are just so below him and we can't transcend like he does and we don't know what's to come and he does. And he knows, okay, if I do this a day too early, it's going to cause a train wreck down the road. <laughs> and so there's a time for everything. And um, I think that's how we should see that. Yeah. What... Um for someone who's going through that, um, and uh, you're a friend of them, you know, and God's not responding, um, what do you think would be helpful to encourage and lift them up? Um, I just, I'd just be a friend to them. Don't just like come up to them and grab a Bible and just shove it in their face and be like, "You're wrong," and this, that, and the other. Definitely don't do that. That's a bad way to go about it. Um, and I would just show kindness and love to them, and. I'm sure an opportunity will present itself where you can bring it up. And when you bring it up, still don't shove it in his face. Just like plant seeds, just kind of let it grow. You don't want to just throw it in your face. Then you, oh my gosh, it's overbearing, and then throw it away. 
you want it to be interesting. You want to spark that curiosity. Like my friend became curious about what's outside of Christianity. You need to like respark what's curious inside of Christianity. So, yeah, I like that. I wish, I wish there's a lot more time to talk about friendship. Um, you know, and Frodo and Sam's example in the Lord of the Rings, um, walking through difficult things together. Um, I just want to highlight one thing uh, before I pass the mic and. Um, you, um, you make this statement in here um, that God has already been where I'm going and he promises his children that his plans are, their, are for their good and his suffering is so temporary compared to God's ultimate prevailing goodness. Um, there's just a mountain of wisdom here. Um, and going through a lot of painful things uh, in my own life, uh, I can say that this is uh, an incredible thing to hold on to. Um, this is something that I've returned to time and time again, knowing that God is good and that his promises are sure, uh, has got me through a lot of, um, difficult things. And so I'm glad that you have, uh, this understanding at your age and, uh, what amount uh, it is and, um, just seeing the steadiness that you go through life with, um, uh, is encouraging to me. So, um, thank you, uh, thank you for, um, for your oral and for the things that you said and shared. Yes, sir. You're welcome. So one of the things that surprised me about your paper, only your speech only being five pages long, was that um, I think every astronomy assignment that you turned in this year was at least five pages long. <laughs> and uh, I think the total of your words on many of your assignments added up to the sum of everyone else's. Mm -hmm. uh, so take everyone else's answers, add them up. That's Clayton's papers. So you, you had a lot of things to say. I don't know how you found time. To, to do all of it, but I really enjoyed um, uh, uh, reading your thoughts about space mm. and having these conversations. So I'm going to try to, this is difficult for you probably, as it is difficult for me to try to answer these things briefly, because you could give long answers about a lot of these things. But uh, for the, um, uh, tell, tell just a couple quick things, quick, about the size of the universe. It's infinitely expanding right now, and um, dark energy is pushing it outward against gravity. Yeah, get going. About, tell us about dark energy. Uh, dark energy is pushing it out. Um, uh, what's the other, uh, the other unknown component of the universe besides dark energy? Dark matter. Dark pulls matter. Pulls things inward like pulls, gravity. Pulls things inward like gravity. Um, so they're both uh, theoretical names for a real force. Yeah, theoretical you know, names for a real force. We just know they exist. Uh, I'll, I'll quote your last paper here that you turned in. Hashtag, don't you just love that our universe expands by a hypothetical force? That's uh, <laughs> one of the little side comments you threw in there. Um, so, uh, what percentage of um, the universe of the known universe is? fits on the periodic table, protons, neutrons, electrons. Less than 5%. Less than 5%, okay. So what's the other 95%? Dark energy is about 80, and then the rest is dark matter. Okay, good. Uh, how many um, stars are there in the Milky Way? Billions. Yeah, 100, between 100 and 200 billion. Mm. How many galaxies are there in the universe? Millions. Billions, good, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. 100 billion, okay. So, um, uh, inside of our bodies, uh, the things on the periodic table, protons, neutrons, electrons, uh, how much uh, of a, a single atom is empty space? Do you know? A lot. A it's l like, uh, we, what was the thing we did? The, the, the thing? The thing, with the thing, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, we had like... We a, can just say a lot. Okay? Yeah, it was so great. So why do you think God made the universe with like so much unknown in it, so much darkness in it? Like, like what's he... Why? I think personally, you and me are on the same nerd wavelength. So um, I think looking up at the stars is a great case for a creator. I just look up and I'm like, there's no way we just accidentally ended up on this exoplanet with a sun and a moon and gravitational wells that keep us from getting wrecked by asteroids. Like, that just doesn't happen by accident. Um, and we haven't found anyone else like us. So. Uh, I think God allows for the largeness of it to realize that we're actually very small. But even in this largeness, in just this expanse, God still loved us to put us here. 
he could have done so much more, but he decided to make us and have a personal relationship with us. So I think you look out at the stars and you're like, God put me here. He gave me a purpose here when he could have done so much more, but he wanted a relationship with me. And I think that's really inspiring. No, that's right. Why do you think he set things up in such a way that there's a lot of things we can't know the answers to? I think if you have a hard time living with mystery, I think Christianity's got to be difficult. Um, yeah, it's great to know stuff. I wish I knew all the stuff about space and Christianity, but I just don't. Nobody does. And probably nobody ever will until we go to heaven. But um, I think God allows a mystery to use God as a crutch, not when you need him, but use him as a crutch all the time. And have something to fall back on. Like, I don't know this answer. I don't know why God let this happen. I don't know if this hap- uh, um I don't know why... Let's see. I don't know if there's other creatures lying without in space, but one thing I do know is that God's sovereign and his nature is loving. And I think mystery really makes you rely on God. So, Yeah, I think that's great. And you know, we, could, we can spend a lot of our times, especially if you're a big question asker, which clearly you are, focusing on the things that you don't understand. But there are a lot of things that we can know and, mm-hmm. and God can be found there. Yeah. And, um, and that's... Uh, to quote a profound philosopher, not C.S. Lewis, he didn't make it into this oral, so that's disappointing. Uh, <laughs> while science is awesome, if it could literally prove in your face that God existed, then our faith would not be by faith, it would be by science. That's another thing you wrote in your last paper, so I think that's a good way to close things up. So, mm-hmm. um, so I guess it's your turn. Let us have it. Fire at will. Okay, we'll do, we'll do Miss Westfall first. I don't want to disappoint you like Hagen did yesterday. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so do you want like a funny one or like I guess kind of a? It's your choice. It's your choice. Ah, uh, I don't know why I think your son Ryan is hilarious. Do you have any funny stories about Ryan? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you don't, I can. I have another one that I'm gonna steal from court, and I would love to steal from court. Y- yeah, yeah, that's good. Um. I do have things about Ryan, but he's at the age now where probably should stop sharing those things publicly. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to have discretion on that. So. Okay. Uh, the other one, um, Court, I'm sorry, but you're just telling it from me. I know you really enjoy your cat. I actually do like my cat. I really do. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I know it's a minority opinion among males, but <laughs> I do like the cat. Um, would you rather be have a cat's personality or a dog's body or a dog's personality and a cat's body? Uh, <laughs> definitely, I, I, well, do I get to choose what size a dog? Sure. Okay, definitely a dog's body uh, with a cat's personality, but, but kind of like the biggest dog you can find. Um, that, like that's what I would. Like, cat, like, yeah, or like a St. Bernard with a cat's personality, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably where I would go. That's so. hilarious. And C.S. Lewis rocks. All right. Yes, it does. I'll do, I'll do Mr. Custer next. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, I kind of have two, and I kind of want to know the answer to both. Okay. But if you know Mr. Custer, he has a lot of puzzles in his office. And has there ever been a puzzle you can't solve? Because I see when they're just like tearing them apart, putting them back together, I'm like, it took me three weeks to get that. I feel like an idiot. And so has there ever been a puzzle in your office that like you just haven't gotten yet? Uh, there's not a physical puzzle in my office I haven't gotten, I but there is, there is one I've been trying to crack, and I haven't yet, so I might need some help, um, some diligent minds. Um, it has to do with um, a kind of logic puzzle where a person comes across three different aliens. Each of the aliens um, uh, has a different way of answering, so one always speaks truthfully, one always speaks falsely, and one uh, is random. Well, you get to ask uh, a question. You can ask three questions. You can ask the same one. Um, and, but you have to ask only to one of the aliens. Well, the, the trick is, is that they each answer in a different language. You don't know the language, and they answer with yes or no. So you, you have to figure out what's the yes and no, and uh, which is which by the end of the puzzle. And you only get those three questions. Sounds very complicated. It is tricky. It, it, sounded, it reminded me of the game we played in Great Books 4 with the coin game, remember? Oh. You had like the mimic, and then you had the clown, and then you had the guy that always takes, and the other yeah. guy that always gives. That's what I thought about instantly. Oh, and then the other one was, what superhero do you think best exemplifies faith? Best 
Um, identifies can't say vision. <laughs> can't, yeah. Um, idealizes faith. Best. Mm. I guess through hardship, because that's kind of what this is about. My, well, since I'd love to figure out the, the actual ideal best, and I probably don't have the time to do that, <laughs> I'll say, um, I'll say there's, there's a couple, uh, I think, that do. Uh, one is Thor. Yeah. Um, when you see him uh, in a number of times, he you know, he's, loses his hammer, doesn't have the ability to be Thor, and has to, um, to trust that Odin, his, uh, his father, um, has good in mind, has to learn to see that. Um, and so he comes to the point um, where he he is worthy because he does trust his father. So um, and so, answer. yeah. So I think he does. And then there's there's you know other you know points down the road too. You know with his, Iron Man. <laughs> Just out of it. Yeah, he's a good character. He's he's a you know a, a large mixed bag. You know, yeah. We'll we'll say that for now. Thank you. All right. In our astronomy class, uh, we got learned by Mr. Priya about some pickup lines. Oh, jeez. I have a breakup line on my phone. I was going to give you the opportunity, if you have one in your head right now, say it. But if you don't, I have one on my phone and I can read it. A breakup line? A breakup line. It's on the Space Cadets group chat. (laughs) So so what do you want to hear from me? (laughs) A pickup. One of, being one of your pickup lines. Oh, man. Oh, I remember the video lines. he showed us. We were talking to him, and he came up with a pickup line on the spot. We were like, you got to tell that to your wife. And so he was like, she won't even flinch. She grew up with I mean, we've been together. And so he took a video, set it up on his table. She was making dinner. He said it. He was smiling. She was like. <laughs> yeah, well, that's maybe all the context that you guys need to know that there's never a dull moment in class. But we, we read deep scientific philosophy and you know come across these awkward lines and i'm like that sounds like a pickup line and so and so then I, it's usually hagen's excuse me hagen's suggestion that he says hey say that to your wife and so so uh you know um so so i have on multiple occasions i've only videoed one and uh she she has to roll her eyes a lot um but uh, yeah so i saw one that um uh, on instagram that said um my, uh, uh, my love for you. No, I can, you find read, I can yeah. read the one yeah. that you did on the yeah. Well, re- chat. Um, re- read the one with the picture on it, the Arkansas picture that uh, Lucas oh, had God. his commentary on. The breakup line's hilarious. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the lead up into it. And, well, I have a screenshot. I can't scroll okay. up. You spit. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you said right. like forgive us. You We're said like three hundred things a day. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I have to scroll for hours. Yeah. Great. <laughs> this one's like three paragraphs long. What's up? Okay, so um, Lucas's was, or th- this pickup line was, "Love is strong, but gravity is stronger." Yes, and I was like, "That is romantic." And and Lucas was like, "That that really actually sounds like a breakup line." <laughs> and so so then here was my breakup line, and we'll stop with that. But it was, "Babe, we started off as opposites, <laughs> but electromagnetism says opposites attract." <laughs> My love for you grew strong, grew to the magnitude of the strong nuclear force. Then things started to, to decay like the radioactive weak nuclear force. Now I'm not even attracted to you as much as gravity, which is by far the weakest of the four fundamental forces, by the way. <laughs> then this is a shout out for the people who have read Case for a Creator. Like, consider a ruler that covers the width of the known universe. The range of the four strengths is broken into one inch increments. Strong nuclear is the length of the entire ruler. Gravity is the length of one inch. One inch. Our love, less than that. It's over. <laughs> the waving hand emoji. So. He's a scholar. He's it's crazy. He's he's learned in the arts of pickup lines. Well, so lines. Uh, you guys uh, can pray for your children since they come to school with me. <laughs> it's been a gift to know you, Clayton, and uh, and thank you for exploring deep and difficult things, and I pray that um, God will make himself known to you through these dark valleys. So let me close this in prayer. God, you are good. Um, you, you have our good in mind, um, even when it feels like you're hiding, um, when we need you the most. 
I think some is because uh, you don't want us to trust in answers and formulas, but you want us to trust in a person and um, to know you for who you are and not who we think you should be. Um, God, thank you for these years with Clayton um, at MCA and the things that you have taught him and that you will continue to teach him. We love you in Christ's name we pray. Amen.